This is the history of the Whiting Sawmill. It begins in Connecticut in 1785. Elisha Whiting Jr. was born to Elisha Sr. and Susanna. Elisha's father died when he was very young and his mother Susanna, not knowing what else to do, bound her son Elisha out to an old Quaker who was very cruel. He eventually ran away to Lee, Berkshire County, Massachusetts, where he worked for a wheelwright and learned carpentry skills. Although Elisha detested his situation, he learned to value the trade and skills acquired during his apprenticeship, and these skills became part of the legacy he later shared with his descendants. From Ohio to Missouri and from Illinois to Utah, his sons and grandsons would eventually make wagons, chairs, and furniture for their own use and for market. This trying apprenticeship also prepared him and his family for the enormous demands of pioneering and migration beyond the frontier. While he was in Lee, Massachusetts, Elisha, age 19, met Sally Hewlett, age 17, and they were married September 18, 1805. They had their first six children while living in Lee, Massachusetts. Edwin was their third child and was born September 9, 1809. Elisha didn't have access to a sawmill as we think of it today, so he had to cut his own timber to have the wood necessary to make the chairs, furniture, and wheels that he produced. In 1816, Elisha and Sally Whiting, along with the extended Hewlett family, migrated to Nelson Township, Portage County, Ohio. Edwin would have been almost seven years old at the time. Ohio was the western frontier at this time and provided suitable timber to support his large family. Elisha built a double log house using one room to live in and the other for a wagon and carpenter shop. Their remaining six children were born here in Nelson, Ohio and Edwin attended school and was fairly well educated for his time. Sometime during the year 1830, Sylvester Hewlett, Edwin's uncle, went to Kirtland, Ohio where he met Oliver Cowdery and other missionaries of the newly organized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Sylvester returned with a copy of the Book of Mormon. In May of 1830, the prophet Joseph Smith and Parley P. Pratt visited Nelson and bore testimony of the Book of Mormon. Sally Whiting was the first to be converted and was baptized October 29, 1830. When the prophet Joseph moved to Hiram, Ohio, he was only five miles from Nelson. This afforded the family many opportunities to come in contact with the prophet and several more members of the Whiting and Hewlett families were baptized. Edwin learned the carpenter trade of his father and also became a craftsman who made chairs, wagons, wagon wheels, and furniture. Edwin had a chair factory as did his father, Elisha Jr and would have been involved in obtaining timber from the area. On September 21, 1833, Edwin, age 24, married Elizabeth Partridge Tillotson, age 19. For the next five years, they lived in Garrettsville, Ohio. This was about four miles from the family living in Nelson, Ohio. Their first three children were born there. After five years of marriage, Edwin and Elizabeth joined the extended family in Missouri and were baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Wherever Elisha Jr. or Edwin lived, they set up a chair shop. They established shops in Massachusetts, Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, Iowa, and finally in Utah. While in Yelrome, Illinois, an angry mob set fire to their home and chair shop and they were forced to move into Nauvoo. After moving to Nauvoo, Edwin married his second and third wives, Almira Meacham and Mary Elizabeth Cox. Edwin was sealed to his three wives in the Nauvoo Temple. In April 1844, Edwin was called to serve a mission to Pennsylvania. Along with preaching the gospel, he was asked to assist in Joseph Smith's campaign for President of the United States. He returned home sometime after the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram Smith. Being experienced woodworkers and wheelwrights, the Whitings did much work to prepare the saints to leave Nauvoo. While living in Illinois, the Whitings were also very involved with the building of the Nauvoo Temple, and at least one of the beams for the temple was produced at the Whiting shop. Edwin sold a load of his chairs in Quincy, Illinois to purchase supplies for the trip west because they were driven out of Nauvoo. Elisha Jr. and his family settled at Mount Pisgah, Iowa, where they stayed for three years. 
The first thing Edwin and Elisha Jr. did was set up a chair shop. They had a regular market for their chairs and other furniture in Quincy, Illinois, which was about 250 miles away. In the evenings, the chair shop would often hold dances and socials. 1849, Edwin left Mount Pisgah to come to Utah. His parents, Elisha and Sally, had both died and most of his siblings were going to Minnesota with Alpheus Cutler. His sister Emmeline, who was married to Walter Cox, would be the only one immigrating to Utah with Edwin and his family. After arriving in Salt Lake City in 1849, the Whitings and Coxes were asked to settle in Manti, Utah. They arrived in Manti in November and built dugouts in the south side of the hill where the Manti Temple now stands. Edwin's dugout must have been crowded with his family of three wives and eight children and a chair shop. He immediately set up a foot lathe and went to work making chairs. To get the necessary wood, Edwin and his son William, then 15 years old, brought timber out of the mountains on a hand sled. As soon as they could get timber from the mountains, they began building log houses. Edwin built 100 chairs that winter and in the spring took them to Salt Lake for trade for supplies. They had no trouble selling their chairs. Edwin and his family spent 12 years in Manti. However, Edwin was gone for two years on a mission to the eastern states from 1854 to 1856. In 1861, Edwin got permission from Brigham Young to move his family to a climate more favorable for fruit production. The fruit trees Edwin brought from Ohio did not fare well in the cold Manti winters, so he pulled up roots again and relocated in the small city of Springville, 50 miles north. As Edwin's family grew, it became necessary to secure additional land for the sons to farm. He first homesteaded 160 acres on Union Bench, which is now known as Mapleton. He divided it among his older boys. As the younger boys grew up, he homesteaded more land in Hobble Creek Canyon. His land was in the left-hand fork of Hobble Creek, and this is where they built their first sawmill. In 1935, a monument was erected by Edwin's descendants marking the location of the homestead. The inscription on the monument reads, In memory of Edwin Whiting, pioneer, born September 9, 1809, died December 8, 1890, homesteaded this ranch in 1871, erected August 17, 1935 by his family. The Maple Creek Recreation Area is named Whiting Forest Camp. Edwin Marion was the fifth child born to Edwin and Mary Whiting. He was born August 8, 1857 in Manti, Utah. Edwin Marion learned many skills from his father. He learned the carpenter trade in the chair factory, the blacksmith trade in his father's shop. He learned to love tilling the soil by working in the gardens and orchards, and he learned how to keep bees. As the years went on, it was important to Edwin Marion not just to teach his children to work, but to like to work and to take pride in a job well done. In 1878, Edwin Marion made his first trip to Brigham City, Arizona at age 21. It was here where he met Anna Maria Isaacson and decided not to return to Utah as planned. In 1881, Edwin Marion and Anna Maria Isaacson were married and settled in Arizona, where they lived until 1888. When they returned to Utah in 1888, Edwin Marion used all his savings and bought a water mill to saw lumber. There were no other mills around and there was a lot of good timber on the mountains. When the stream went dry, they had to move the mill farther up the mountain. They built a shack at the mill and Mariah cooked for the mill hands. They lived there until time for Ernest to be born in February 1889. Water power was not dependable enough, so Edwin Marion bought his first steam engine and boiler for the sawmill in Mapleton. He had to go into debt $450 to buy the steam engine. His brother Lute said that Edwin Marion would ruin the Whiting name going into debt for all of that, but his brother John thought better of it and went into business with him. With hard work and careful management, Edwin Marion was able to pay for the steam engine and boiler and buy out John's share of the business. They sold all the lumber they could to people who came to the mill to buy and took the extra to Provo and sold it for $12 a thousand board feet delivered. From the time Ernest was six, his father Edwin Marion assigned him the job of watching the steam gauges at the mill. 
Edwin Marion didn't trust some of the grown men who worked for him to do the job, but Ernest seemed to like the same things his father did and took the responsibility very seriously. Edwin Marion's brothers, John and Art, and others also helped run the mill. From an early age, Edwin Marion and Mariah's children worked together for their father and mother at innumerable unpaid tasks. All of Edwin Marion's children were taught that work was enjoyable and worthwhile. The boys became his business partners in numerous ventures until the time of his death in 1934 at the age of 77. After Mariah moved into town, Edwin Marion ran the mill a while longer up in the canyon. He would walk to town to be with his family over Sunday and then walk back up to the mill again. Finally, he moved the mill down to town and ran it there with the addition of a planing mill, which he bought. In spite of the success and happiness the family was experiencing in Mapleton, Edwin Marion felt he was supposed to return to Arizona and finish his mission. He sold his sawmill and other business interests and moved back to Arizona in 1901 with Mariah and their eight children. Upon returning to Arizona, they settled in St. John's, and he soon rented a little sawmill and cut lumber to build the store. A few years later, he homesteaded some timber land in the White Mountains. On May 5, 1911, the Forest Service of the United States Department of Agriculture issued a sawmill permit to E. M. Whiting and H. A. Berry, partners doing business under the firm name and style of Whiting and Berry having an office and principal place of business at St. John's, Arizona. The permit was for a steam-powered sawmill having a daily capacity of 5,000 board feet. A board foot, by definition, is a board one foot in length, one foot wide, and one inch thick. Some 75 years after the issuance of this original sawmill permit, the descendants of E.M. Whiting owned and operated sawmills and related lumber processing facilities having an annual capacity of approximately 150 million board feet. Edwin Marion built a sawmill a short distance above the homestead near the Little Giant Spring. The mill would be moved periodically to be closer to the timber. The last site is what we think of as the old Whiting sawmill. Edwin Marion, Ernest, and Jay Whiting loved to build sawmills and use the same method of planning. Most of the plans were only in their heads. If you were lucky, it was sketched on a napkin. There was a little stream that furnished the water for the camp as well as for the steam engine that produced the power to drive the log carriage. They had that little mill there. In about 1900, they called it, that's where they got the name, the Little Giant. They had the little old steam engine, they said it was the Little Giant, and that's where its name come from. They could get a board whittled off with it if they steam it up good. They would take it, you know, it was a, one with a firebox in the engine. And they'd build a big fire in that. And then they went out under the, you know how they're built, with the flue sticking on out in the smokestack. And then they had a big firebox under that, and they'd build a fire all over that thing to give up <laughs> enough steam to run that mill. And then they called it the Little Giant because they could get aboard all with it. The sawmill life offered employment and work for the whole family and many others who came through the years to work for them. When the snow got too deep, they moved to St. John's for the winter, and as soon as the roads were passable, they would return to the sawmill. Edwin Marion and his son-in-law, Herbert Berry, owned the sawmill together. When Herbert decided to go into dental school, he sold his shares to Ernest, who had recently returned from his mission. Two years later, Ernest bought out his father. Ernest worked very closely with his older brother, E.I., who sold the lumber and helped buy machinery and needs for the sawmill. All of the other brothers were involved at times in logging, selling, and marketing the sawmill products. Marie Barry Hamblin described the mill houses as follows. The mill houses were all alike and were built to be moved later if necessary. They were about 12 feet by 20 feet and made of rough 1 by 6s with boards running vertical. Another round of 1x3s over the cracks made a fairly snug cabin. It had one big room for cooking, eating, and general living with a small pantry on the cool side. 
A big wood stove and cupboards ran along one wall, and a family homemade table with benches took up the rest of the room. The average mill house had an alcove or two for bedrooms. Only women with small babies brought rocking chairs. Built with no foundation, the roof was made by bending boards over the ridge pole put high enough to give the roof a slight curve down. Two layers of boards with the narrower boards over the cracks made a good tight roof and seldom leaked. Edwin, Marion, and Ernest could build a mill house in one day and move in by eventide. If you've ever seen Uncle Ernest drive an eight-penny nail with one blow, you wouldn't say it couldn't be done. I lived at the mill when I was a child and remember one time when Uncle Ernest started another new house. But strangely, there was no new family around that I could see. I wondered about that, but was too small to ask about it. I watched this house closely as it was going up. After it was finished, he kept on working on it for several days. He built a big chest for quilts and things and a tiny little cupboard for shelves besides a small shelf for knickknacks. In the bedroom he built what he called a dressing table. I had never heard that word. One day Uncle Ernest went off someplace and didn't come back for a long time. Long enough for all us kids to miss him very much. When he came back he brought with him a beautiful girl. She had big, dark, shining eyes, long, long dark hair, and the most flawless complexion you have ever seen. She was certainly the most beautiful woman at the mill. Burl turned it into a cheerful home with pictures on the walls, wildflowers on the table, and curtains at the windows. She continued to cook for the mill hands for 13 years until Ernest sold his shares to Eddie. Everyone loved to eat Burl's bread and beans, which she made fresh each day. Jay Whiting wrote the following about Edwin Marion's pocket watch and his emphasis on being punctual. Edwin Marion was one that wanted to start his sawmill on time and stop on time. It seems that while running his sawmill near the present homestead, he found that he did not have a dependable watch to start and stop the sawmill by. A salesman came by with this big beautiful Elgin Railroad pocket watch. Grandpa wanted the watch so he traded the man one of their milk cows for it. When he told Grandma, Anna Maria Whiting, about it, well, there was a mad little Danish woman. This did not change Grandpa's mind, and this was his timepiece for the mill while he ran the sawmill. This watch was given to Ernest when he purchased a sawmill from his father, Edwin Marion. It has since been passed on to Ernest's son, Ernest J. Whiting Jr., known as Jay, and now to Jay's son, Ernest J. Whiting III, known as Trey. To Edwin Marion, time was so valuable. He was one that believed that you should be on time and doing everything, including paying your obligations, going to church, and other social and family meetings. During the years the Whitings operated the sawmill, two tragic events occurred. Edwin Marion's brother, Charles, and his family had moved to Mexico. One summer, John, Charles' young son, came to Arizona and worked for Edwin Marion and his family at the mill. John was in a terrible accident. The saw cut across the middle of his body. In spite of all they could do, John died. This was such a sorrow to Edwin Marion and all his family that the mill was never quite the same again. The other incident was when Arthur, their youngest son, was bitten by a mad dog that belonged to some of the people who were working at the mill. Edwin, Marion, and Mariah took him to Los Angeles for treatments and were surely blessed as the treatments were successful and Arthur's life was spared. Those early days in Apache County were incredibly rugged by present day standards, yet it is doubtful that any family group ever had a greater measure of pure enjoyment. An enjoyment of people who deeply loved each other and helped instintingly in the accomplishment of mutual goals. Undoubtedly, though, the chief element in both the happiness and contentment of the early period and their later achievements was the towering love and respect that all the Whitings held for their parents, and the deep religious feeling that Anna Maria and Edwin Marion Whiting passed on to their posterity. After the death of Edwin Marion in 1934 and the death of his son Lynn 18 months later, the four remaining Whiting brothers, Eddie, Ernest, Ralph, and Art, continued to work together as a team.
Ever since Grandpa Edwin Marion had struggled over the Buckskin Mountains in northern Arizona, the family had looked longingly at the lush but remote Kaibab as a woodland bonanza. Early in 1945, the Whiting brothers bought a sawmill in Fredonia, Arizona from the Cutler brothers. They also bought a mill on the Kaibab owned by the Short Creek Group. When Jay Whiting returned from the Navy in December 1945, it was decided that he and his brother-in-law, Harold Bushman, would go to the North Kaibab and build some mills and do the logging for the mills already there. Whiting and Bushman Logging Partnership was formed. As soon as they could get into the mountains, they started building the sawmill in Lower Orderville Canyon. They also built a repair shop and 20 little homes for people who would be working at the mill and in the logging woods. The Whiting brothers also contracted to have a sawmill built in Upper Orderville Canyon as well. Because of the short logging season on the Kaibab, it was decided the next year they would build a sawmill just off the Kaibab in House Rock Valley. They would store logs during the summer at the House Rock Mill and cut them in the winter with the crews from the Orderville Canyon Mill. Logging methods were still pretty primitive and logs were skidded with horses. They bought some World War II surplus vehicles in hopes they would be useful in the woods. However, they didn't work as well as they had hoped. The half-track here at the homestead is one of those vehicles. They also bought some post-war trucks to haul logs to the Fredonia Mill. The high watermark of the Whiting family's lumber career came in 1950. The four Whiting brothers outbid all competitors for timber rights in a 250 square mile section of the Kaibab under U.S. Forestry Service control called the Big Saddle Cell. Mickey Whiting attended the famous bidding procedures with his father Art and recalls that memorable day. And I'll tell you what was ironic. They had looked forward to that sale and they had put got together enough money to do the bid. They had to have opening uh, bid money. When the couriers and their lawyer from Flagstaff showed up, what was ironic is couriers had been our biggest lumber customer up until then in Detroit. And they walked into that bidding room, that forest service, and there was Jerry Courier and his lawyer sitting there. By establishing their small sawmill operations on the Kaibab and in Fredonia, the Whiting brothers were ready when their opportunity arrived. With the contract signed, they built one of the most thoroughly mechanized mill facilities in the Southwest, an up-to-date woods operation, and purchased a fleet of trucks and other mobile equipment. The $1.5 million investment was soon paying off. The Whiting Brothers Kaibab Lumber Company was in full swing by 1952, harvesting a bumper crop from America's greatest stand of virgin ponderosa pine. Since then, they have worked wonders of woodmanship that gained national recognition. The Whiting Brothers were involved with many different business ventures, but their hearts were always close to the lumber business. At one time, they had sawmills in Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah with planing mills and concentration yards in Denver, Colorado, Flagstaff, Holbrook, Eager, and Fredonia, Arizona, and a plywood plant in Durango, Mexico. In 1953, Ralph Whiting and his family sold their interest in Kaibab and moved to Mesa. They later sold their Arizona interests and moved to Whitewater, Colorado. In 1958, Eddie Whiting sold his interest in Kaibab to concentrate on other business holdings. Eddie and his sons, Farr and Virgil, had businesses that were even larger than Kaibab Lumber Company. They had sawmills in Arizona and New Mexico, service stations, motels, the Ford Agency, and the cash store. Uncle Eddie and the family were devastated when his two sons were killed in a plane crash in 1961. After this terrible tragedy, a monument was erected to the memory of Farr and Virgil Whiting here at the homestead and dedicated in 1974. A year and a half later, Uncle Eddie Whiting died at the age of 80. Art and Ernest still owned the Kaibab Lumber Company, but soon turned over the day-to-day -day management to their sons, E.J. Whiting and Mickey Whiting. 
The Kaibab lumber business prospered for almost 50 years, but due to environmental activities and government red tape, they were forced to close the Fredonia Mill and all of their timber business in 1995. I became primarily involved in the, manner, in the political process because it became more and more evident that the environmental pressures were going to cause us not to be able to continue to buy or harvest timber from U.S. Forest Service lands. In so doing, I became quite involved with the National Forest Products Association and spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. under three different presidents. That association was huge. It represented all of the lumber and plywood production in the United States and Canada. So it was no small task. And it was a very political effort and uh, Jay and I realized that there was going to come a day when the environmental pressures were going to cause us a problem in continuing in the lumber business. Well, that happened. We went on through uh, those years of the 40s um, and then the 50s and 60s. Uh, when the Endangered Species Act and the environmental legislation took hold, we gradually had to phase out of the lumber and timber business. Our large mill at Fredonia, Arizona, which was a, our crown jewel, was shut down. It was shut down, I can't remember the name. It made national news and uh, we have many fond memories of what we contributed to southern Utah and northern Arizona and the Kaibab Forest. This was indeed one of the saddest days in the lives of Jay and Mickey Whiting and their families. No one could have imagined that the family legacy would end in such a senseless way. In spite of sawmill life ending, we are grateful for the lessons we learned along the way. We learned to love work and take pride in the job well done. We learn to work together and to love one another. We learn many lessons through tragedy and death, but most of all, we learn to love the Lord and know that we can do anything with His help. Thank goodness for the great memories and heritage that we have each been left with.